Well, it's, um, it's a tribute to Sam and this whole organization that they have the courage to invite an engineer to speak to an audience. Um, any of you who've read Susan Cain's book on um, quiet knows me pretty well. Um, so it's a really unlikely thing that I'm here. Um, I'm passionate about changing education because education changed me. So the real purpose of this talk is to tell you a little bit about how edu education can change lives. Uh, it turns out that, I mean, Olin College, I'm, I'm not going to talk much about, but I just want to say a little bit for those of you who've never heard about it. It's a startup. It was created in essentially 1999 with about a $500 million investment from a private foundation who believed that change in higher ed has to happen. And the only way to do it is to blow it up and start over. So Olin College has no tenure. We have no academic departments. Students pay very little tuition. And everything at the school has an expiration date, including the curriculum. Um, so this is different, OK? Um, in, since 2010, we've been visited by 650 universities. We have a mission to change education on a broader scale. So we've partnered with Harvard, with Stanford, with the University of Illinois at Urbana that has re-engineered their undergraduate program. There's a book now written on, as a result of that partnership. Currently working with the University of Texas at El Paso, one of the largest Hispanic producing schools. So we have a mission. But I think that we have a mission that is much bigger than the school and it's much bigger than engineering. So it happens that this year I've been asked by the National Academy of Engineering to chair this committee that is responsible for hosting the Global Grand Challenge Summit in Washington next July. So this is a meeting from around the world for people who are worried about the biggest problems on the planet. They fall into four general categories. Sustainability, security, global health, and enhancing life. I mean, if you've been paying attention, you probably know that the global population has been growing. In fact, if you look at a graph of the population of humans on this planet throughout all of history, it looks like a hockey stick. To about 1920, it was less than 2 billion. Maybe 1900 was less than a billion. Now it's at 7 billion. We're heading for 9 billion. There are big problems ahead. There isn't any aspect of human life on the planet that won't be touched by this graph. And that's why we're worried. But I think, frankly, I think the National Academy may have gotten it wrong. I think the biggest challenge we have is not any of those four. The biggest challenge that we have is educating the next generation to deal with these challenges. They have to think differently, completely differently, in order to grasp the speed and the flexibility and the holistic nature of these problems. So that's what I want to talk about. And so since education changed my life, you have to know something about my life. So I thought I'd start here, OK? That's me. That's. Um, my sixth birthday. Now, what I want you to look at is what, where we're standing. That's my backyard. Um, this building that you see back there that's kind of falling down. Oh, by the way, this is in a place called Tranquility, California, and it's in 1955. Um, it's really tranquil there. Um, there's about 650 people, uh, if you count the chickens and the dogs, and it's 40 miles to the nearest hospital. Uh, my dad was born on the kitchen table, the house I grew up in, and it was very similar for all of our neighbors. Um, in fact, my dad told me, if you don't go to college, this is what you'll do for the rest of your life. Now, the farm that I grew up in, uh, at that, about the time that picture was taken, raised chickens. So you see a picture of my dad there, um, and we had just received this big shipment of baby chicks. They come in those cardboard boxes, and they run around like ants. And you know, some weeks later, they look like the picture on the left, and they come and pick them up. Now, the school that we went to had an awful lot of um, Hispanic Americans that were farm laborers, and they moved around a lot because they had to pick crops. Um, when we graduated from high school, almost nobody went to college. So there's about 120 kids in our high school class. I think less than 10% of us went to college. Probably about 5% of us went to a four-year college. 
But I did well in school, and my dad said, you're going to do something with your life. Um, so I applied to the best schools in California, to Stanford, to Caltech, to the University of California. I got rejected at Stanford and Caltech. <laughs> I got accepted at the University of California because they had to. There's a state law in California. If you graduate in the top 10% of your class, they have to admit you. And in fact, if you graduate you know, as the valedictorian or the salutatorian, they automatically have to give you honors and entrance. So I went off to the University of California, and I thought, this is going to be really cool. And then I met the kids who grew up in San Francisco, in LA. And they had calculus and physics. Um, so that was about an existential threat there for a while. Um, but it worked out. University of California did a great job for me. And I went off to graduate school. And I went to MIT, and I studied earthquake engineering at that time. And I had this crazy idea that you could protect buildings from earthquakes by unbolting them from the ground and putting some kind of a flexible suspension system, sort of like a car, you know, that flexes its knees so that the building doesn't get shaken around too much. And that's what you see there in that picture at the top. That's a schematic of a building on the left that's bolted to the ground while the earth is shaking. So you see the walls are flexing and there's a lot of stress in it. But the building on the right has unbolted from the ground and has these bearings down there that let it slip around. They said at MIT, this is such a great idea, you should actually go to Caltech, where they know something about earthquakes, and actually make one. So I thought that's a great idea. So off we went to California. I showed up at Caltech. I went to the earthquake engineering department. Actually, Caltech is where earthquake engineering was invented. Maybe you've heard of Richter, OK? Um, so I walked in, put down this thesis. I'm now 23 years old, OK? I have this idea, we're going to fix all of California. Um, what you have to do is unbolt the building from the ground and you know, put these bearings in it. <laughs> and I'm talking to this guy in his 60s who is a god in earthquake engineering. So what does he tell me? Well, no self-respecting civil engineer would unbolt it from the ground, you use bigger bolts. What do you do? Okay, I really believed in this, but this guy, is like the god in earthquake engineering. I had a crisis for a while. I eventually decided not to major in civil engineering. I majored in something that nobody understands called applied mechanics. It's a kind of applied physics that has a lot of math in it, and nobody knows what you do, so including my wife. <laughs> I did that thesis, okay, and it worked out okay. But I learned a lot from that interaction. I learned that I'm not an entrepreneur. I, as time went on, I began to believe that I didn't have enough confidence in my own ideas to rebel when the establishment thought they had it right. It took me a while to figure that out. Now, I have a brother. Dad told him the same thing. He went to the University of California, became an engineer as well. But he is an entrepreneur, OK? He went to work at Delco Electronics after he graduated. He was the chief engineer on the fire control system for the F-16 airplane. This is a, a RISC computer that's very powerful. He kept telling Delco, this computer, this could change the world. You should be using this um, to study the climate change, to look at cancer. And they said, no, 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 this is, like, this is for airplanes. So he quit. And he brought one person with him. He went to San, San Francisco. He started a business in his garage, RISC modular computers. My dad called me up, and he said, Talk some sense into your brother, OK? He's going to lose everything. He has no, no health insurance now. You're going to wind up putting his kids through college. Um, I said, look, Dad, Jeff's the smartest guy I know. He'll figure it out. Uh, it took him eight years, but he did. He got the cash flow to work. Um, today, Jeff is the CEO of this company called Active Video Networks. It's his fourth company. So Jeff has a house in Las Gatas. He has a house in Fremont. He has a house in um, Heavenly Valley. He has a small ranch in Colorado, and he has two airplanes. So <laughs> I'm not worried about putting his kids through college. <laughs> That's what entrepreneurs do. Um, now, when I was about 28, teaching at UC Santa Barbara, I couldn't pay the bills, because salaries were too low. In fact, my salary when I started there was $12,000 a year. 
the graduates with a bachelor's degree in my field were making $16,000 a year. And my wife was saying, can you explain to me again why we're doing this? Um, so I found consulting. The only consulting place in the, in the area had to do with aerospace. So I wound up being the personal consultant to the CEO of a company called Astro Research Corporation, and we were designing a way to catch Halley's Comet and get some of the stuff in the tail so that we could bring it home. Turns out that's a job that's not easy to do because Halley's Comet's going the wrong way. All the other planets are going this way, Halley's Comet goes that way, so you have to launch and make a U-turn and then accelerate. You can't get there from here. You can't do that with a rocket, it turns out. There is no propulsion system that'll do it. You can only do it with nuclear ion, or you can do it with solar sailing. JPL is making this solar sail. Our competitor was the Helio Gyro, which is a helicopter that flies in the solar wind. Um, it has 12 blades. Each blade is seven miles long, okay? You can feather them like a propeller on an airplane. And of course, the Challenger accident happened, and America was the only country that didn't have any satellite to chase Halley's Comet. Um, but I got involved in the design of this, and I got exposed to what design means. This had nothing to do with any of the courses I'd taken at, at Caltech or MIT. And the person who was leading it uh, changed my life. I understand entirely now why you need the other half of your brain to do engineering right. Interesting. Um, so then I'm teaching at USC in Los Angeles, and I'm teaching this course where it has to do with aerospace, and I have these groups of students, and they're working with companies, and the companies are saying, you know, this is the kind of problem that we're working on, so I ask our group of students to pick one of those problems and do the same problem. Do it on our campus, do the best you can. At the end of the semester, we'll bring the corporate sponsors together with the students, and we'll, um, we'll have the students present what they did, and then they can go to have lunch with the guys from the company, that will tell them this is how you really solve the problem. That was the big idea. But something really different happened. So the group of students got up, the first ones, here's what we did. I think the sponsor was from McDonnell Douglas, and they said, oh, um, you guys did a great job. By the way, you've inadvertently stumbled onto our patent in this problem, and it's worth a $200 million contract. That's how we beat Boeing for this particular problem. So the students came up to me afterwards, Dr. Miller, we have a couple of questions, you know. What's a patent, and how do you make money from ideas like this? And I said, oh, you know. So then you go look through the curriculum, and sure enough, all the engineering curriculum has integral signs, it has vectors, it has physics. There's not a dollar sign in the entire curriculum, okay? Um, the business school has this program in entrepreneurship. So I went and talked to the business dean. Hey, you know, can't you do something about this? And the business dean said, oh, we have, we have all kinds of courses. We have new venture creation, marketing managing, new enterprise. We have intellectual property rights in, for technology. But they're in the MBA program. And you can't get into the MBA. I mean, these are undergraduate engineers. Even the business students can't get into the MBA program until they've had two years of experience, blah, blah, blah. Then my dean meets me in the hallway. He says, Rick, what are you trying to do? And I, so I explained it. And I said, you know, I want these engineering students to learn something about business before they leave. And he says, don't you realize, if you figure out how to do this, what's going to happen is the engineering students are going to start enrolling in the business classes. I said, duh, that's the point. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 think about it. If they start enrolling in the business classes, then the tuition dollars are going to go to the business dean and our budget's going to go down. <laughs> Welcome to revenue center management, okay? About that time, I um, decided to move. Again, that's what my wife says, I can't keep a job, so I keep moving around. I went to the University of Iowa in the Midwest, where we found, you know, Iowa City, Iowa is everything that Los Angeles is not entirely. I mean, from weather to traffic to quality of schools, to everything. And nobody's ever heard of it either. Um, they hadn't heard of revenue center management. So that was an opportunity. So I partnered with the business dean. We created this entrepreneurship program for engineers. In 1993, we had the first formal curriculum in technology and entrepreneurship for engineering students in the country. It was on the cover of Inc. magazine. And that's when the Olin folks found me, okay? And they got this, I got this letter from the president of the foundation that said, you know, we'd like for you to come and, and help start this school. Um, I almost put it in the circular file because things were going so well, and whoever heard of this group? 
Um, but the person who nominated me was somebody I didn't want to never nominate me for anything else. So I said, well, well look, I'll just call them up, and I, then I can explain, you know, I looked into this, and it's not the right fit. Well, one thing led to another, and I've been at Olin College now for 17 years. Um, so we've had to rethink everything there is about engineering. In fact, we've decided that there's, let me just tell you quickly, a couple of things that are wrong with engineering education. Last May, when commencement happened across the U.S., millions of kids got their bachelor's degrees, only about 4.5% of them got a degree in any kind of engineering at any university in America. By the way, that compares with about 12% in Europe, about 30% in Asia, and we have a declining market share. And about half the kids who will enroll in engineering this fall, just now, will never graduate in engineering. Many of them will graduate in something else, but they're not going to graduate in engineering. About half of those who leave engineering have higher grades than the ones who stayed. Is there a problem here? Um, we call it the math science death march. Um, there are three problems that, we're, that are at the heart of engineering education today. Number one is that we're attracting the wrong people. Number two is that we're teaching them the wrong stuff. And number three, we're using teaching methods which are known to be largely ineffective. Otherwise, though, we're doing a great job. <laughs> okay. um, so our vision here is that an engineer is a person who envisions what has never been and then does whatever it takes to make it happen. And don't forget the does whatever it takes part. We're talking a lot in this conference about vision. What really makes the world change is the determination, the grit, the continued focus on this that makes the world change. One of my inspirations is on my last slide here, Peretz Levy. Some of you might have heard of the Cornell Tech campus that's being built in New York. Um, this is a partnership between Cornell University and the, and the uh, Technion in Israel. And people are wondering, why the Technion? I mean, there's a lot of schools in the U.S. they could have partnered with. The reason is that the Technion has a singularity in all the world for the number of startup businesses that are generated from there. They are amazing for the number of creative. So when the Wall Street Journal did this investigation, the reporter was very curious, why is that? Why would it be, particularly in Israel, I mean, you have people that shoot at them, okay? Um, why would this be the great place to, to study this? And the, the um, interview with Peretz Levy gave me the inspiration and the insight to understand what entrepreneurs are about. It's about mindset. What did he say? He said, you can't live in Israel without being an optimist. You must always believe there can be a better world and realize that it's always up to you to make it happen. That's the heart of an entrepreneurial spirit, visioning what's not there that makes the world better and the motivation to take whatever action it takes to make it work. By the way, there are other people in the world who, when things don't go well, imagine who to blame for it and devote their whole career to trying to do something in the opposite direction. Entrepreneurs don't do that. So it's all about mindset, and that's really the heart of what Olin does. So thank you very much. I appreciate your opportunity to be here.